So one of the questions I asked at the beginning of this series was, is the choice between the state and mutual aid absolute? And what I want to argue today definitively is, no, I don't think it is. Um, and I think that uh, Desert, or the anonymous author of the Desert Manifesto, uh, agrees with that. Um, although his preference, of course, leans on the anarchist side of, uh, you know, um, escape from the state. Uh, but as you recall, Desert also says the state isn't going anywhere fast. But what we find is cracks in the state, um, cracks that expose some weaknesses. Now, I wanted to talk particularly about this concept of mutual aid today because mutual aid is a term that people are hearing for the first time in a lot of cases. Now, people who have been studying political thought for a while, um, maybe particularly socialist and anarchist thought, um, are familiar with this term. But for a lot of people around the world, this is the first time that they've heard this term used and it's being used in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, groups are springing up all over the world, um, some of them not aware of other groups that are already in existence, um, dealing with this concept of mutual aid and how to implement it. Um, this one in the United States is becoming pretty predominant. It's got a presence in a lot of cities and towns now. It's USA covidmutualaid.org. And there you see an ad from Bre Brevard County, Florida for one of their mutual aid organizations associated with this, um, this, this uh, national organization. Um, they use Google Docs. They probably use other things, Facebook pages, to organize getting help to people at this time when there are many people who are not able to uh, get enough food, maybe need to be checked on, um, and they're trying to do it safely as possible. But those have sprung up, and the reason why they've sprung up is because of the cracks that are exposed during this crisis in the ability of the state, and to a certain extent also the ability of the uh, economy to be able to meet the needs, to be able to take care of everything uh, during this time. This is a quote from Desert, which I think exposes how many different types of anarchists there are, which, which may be uh, part of the confusion about anarchy on the part of a lot of people. He says, we are anarcho-syndicalists on the shop floor. Those are the kind that deal with union organization, basically. Green anarchists in the woods, okay? Um, eco uh, anarchists are a different breed. Social anarchists in our communities. Those are some of the people like we saw with this organization for mutual aid, springing up in cities to kind of fill in the gaps. Individualists, when you catch us alone, this is kind of what he thinks is the typical temperament of the uh, anarchist, is kind of to be a libertarian type. Um, Anarcho-communists, when there's something to share, and insurrectionists, when we strike a blow. The latter is kind of what most people think of when they um, hear the term anarchist, if they're not terribly familiar with all of these shades. Um, but at this point in time, the type of anarchist uh, views that are springing up around the world are the kind having to do with mutual aid, which goes along more with the social anarchist category and maybe for some the anarcho-communist category if they really want to get carried away. Um, now, I want to focus more on this term mutual aid because so many people are becoming acquainted with it. Um, one of the founding sources for the concept of mutual aid was Peter Kropotkin, uh, whose dates are 1842 to 1921. He was a Russian anarchist thinker, and he wrote this book, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. And uh, he 
gives some of the inspiration even for uh, modern day anarchists with his view that what really makes human beings strong, what makes us capable of survival is our social capacity, the capacity for people to rather spontaneously come to each other's aid. Um, here's a choice quote from that book. He says, as soon as we study animals, we at once perceive that though there is an immense amount of warfare and extermination going on amidst various species, and especially amidst various classes of animals, there is at the same time as much or perhaps even more of mutual support, mutual aid, and mutual defense again, amidst animals belonging to the same species or at least to the same society. Sociability is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle. So you do see this in the animal kingdom where especially within species, there's uh, what he calls mutual aid, where they're helping and guarding each other and fulfilling certain roles. Um, and this is, he's saying, part of their DNA, part of uh, how they've evolved in order to survive as a species. So here's another quote. He says, the mutual aid tendency in man has so remote an origin and is so deeply interwoven with all past evolution of the human race that it has been maintained by my, mankind up to the present time, notwithstanding all the visit, vicissitudes of history. Okay. So now Kropotkin is, is clearly applying this idea of mutual aid, which he also sees in the animal kingdom, to human beings. And he's saying that human beings are social, and the reason why they've survived is because of this social nature, which includes to a certain extent, in my view, uh, the ability to create hierarchies, but I think Kropotkin might disagree with that. Um, but you can't hardly disagree with the idea that part of what's kept human beings going this long has been their ability to cooperate. And even capitalism um, fosters a certain type of cooperation. It's a cooperation based upon the profit motive. Um, and there have been times in our history where that served us pretty well. But this is not one of those times when it's serving us particularly well. Um, not that it's necessarily bad, but it's not enough because the economy has at least temporarily been shut down almost. And so, for instance, there's the example of the hospitals who are providing critical care to people with coronavirus, but they're also having, having to lay off staff because they aren't making money right now. Um, they are losing money because they can't do all the elective surgeries and treatments that bring them a profit. So at this point in time, the profit motive is not actually fostering the type of cooperation and mutual aid that we need in the hospital to be able to take care of all the patients and just to do the very best job we can at the survival of the human species. Anyway, so Kropotkin here um, is, is giving us the idea that human beings naturally are social, we naturally come to each other's aid, and the anarchists like Kropotkin um, tends to think that past a certain point anyway, capitalism doesn't, uh, well, kind of like pushes back against the instinct of mutual aid and cripples it to a certain extent. Um, here's another quote from Kropotkin. He says, the primitive man has one quality, elaborated and maintained by the very necessities of his hard struggle for life. He identifies his own existence with that of his tribe. And without that quality, mankind never would have attained the level as it has attained now. One of the pushbacks against uh, the uh, tendency in liberalism and capitalism to individualize everybody and kind of isolate people and diminish mutual aid or sociability has been certain elements of the new right. Um, and in, in their assertion of pushback, they've emphasized the idea of tribe 
as as in organization by nationality because that is a time-worn way that human beings have organized and identified with each other i think that's why that's partly why that has come back up people like kropotkin anarchists generally um, aren't attracted to tribe as race but they're still attracted to the idea of identification with one's community whatever that looks like um, and feeling a sense of belonging and obligation to the people around you who help each other okay so somehow if we, if we are to think about mutual aid we probably need to avoid too much identification of tribe with race but see tribe or kin or you know community as the people were actually near um, and this is uh, again we see this popping up kind of spontaneously in this situation that we will help those whom we are near because that makes sense right because they're the ones that can also help us their well-being and the well-being of our community is important to us because it affects us so I think there's a way of, of applying the tribe way of thinking or the local community way of thinking without necessarily having to go towards uh, physical characteristics as a uh, factor in forming that community. So here we have Murray Bookchin, um, a 20th century uh, anarchist thinker who, if you've heard, I, I did at least one other um, video on him about him um, he went through various stages and ended up kind of abandoning anarchism in his old age uh, but at the very same time though much of his influential writing has revolved around uh, various anarchist concepts here we have a quote from the ecology of freedom he says, what has largely replaced the sinews that held community and personality together is an all-encompassing, coldly depersonalizing bureaucracy. The agency and the bureaucrat have become the substitutes for the family, the town, and neighborhood, the personal support structures of peoples in crisis, and the supernatural and mythic figures that afforded power and tutelary surveillance over the destiny of the individual. So that gives you a taste of what he thought was wrong with society. And he did apply the idea of the depersonalizing bureaucracy um, also to the corporate uh, structure of the economy as well as the, the, the government uh, of most liberal democratic states. He said, the social horizon presents the starkly conflicting prospects of a harmonized world with an ecological sensibility based on a rich commitment to community, mutual aid, and new technologies on the one hand, and the terrifying prospect of some sort of nuclear, thermonuclear disaster on the other. Our world, it would appear, will undergo revolutionary changes so far-reaching in character that humanity will totally transform its social relations and its very conception of life, or it will suffer an apocalypse that might well end humanity's tenure on the planet. He's talking there about the, um, the threat of mutual assured destruction. Um, we could also perhaps put in that same category off in the future, uh, the devastation of climate change and potentially the devastation of pandemics like coronavirus. So the question is, why now? Uh, why is mutual aid becoming a buzzword now? And why should it remain in our vocabulary? Well, coronavirus is revealing the weaknesses in our existing political and economic systems. That doesn't mean that those political and economic systems should be replaced. In fact, there's every argument for strengthening them and making them better, making them more responsive, making them stronger. But it's it's exposing the fact that there's probably no human structure that you can create of an overarching kind that's supposed to deal with masses of human beings that can be perfect, that can really fill every single need and take care of everything totally. There are places where it can't work and 
we don't necessarily want it to get so good at getting down to the very micro level of our lives that it can promise to take care of everything. We are in a recession. This is probably a global recession. Maybe even a depression is coming. We'll, we'll have to see. There's no way of knowing how bad the economic uh, pothole is going to be here. Um, we are suffering from social isolation, which is now enforced because of the types of measures that we're having to take with the virus. But, but we've suffered from social isolation in other ways for quite a long time, sequestered behind our paywall, so to speak, um, where we haven't been able to develop the family, extended family, neighborhood, community, strong structure that could help people in the granular details of life uh, to get by better in times like this. And we see this in the tendency of people to hoard um, and to anticipate shortages. And then of course, shortages develop uh, partly because of the hoarding behavior, but hoarding is natural and, and kind of sensible in a society with the mindset that, that we have, where it's kind of every man for himself. So these are some of the cracks in the sidewalk. They're warning signs to us that we need to go back to or reinvent mutual aid, do it better even than we used to do. Because, you know, if we really take a good hard look at the way mutual aid was done in the past, prior to the development of neoliberal, uh, economics, it wasn't too great. Oftentimes it was practiced with prejudice um, and insulation from other people and other ways of life. That needs to change. So we need to do it better, but we need to do it um, because we've got cracks and the cracks are growing. But amidst the cracks, we also are seeing these signs of a new strengthening human spirit. When people are really, really challenged, just as they were during World War II, by an existential threat, something happens. There's a spark of life that hasn't died and you see it in these various attempts that people of all kinds, not just in organizations, but in every way, are trying to do their best to help each other right now, to be kinder to each other, um, I'm just putting up there on the screen a few of the things that I've seen um, in my local community and in the state of Kansas um, that, yes, I did know about before, but which are now becoming much more predominant and are starting to gain tragic traction with a larger number of people. Community-supported agriculture, which is a short shorthand for that is CSAs where you basically support a farmer. You do it at the beginning of their season. So you're basically saying, look, I'm gonna help you with what you need to plant your garden or your farm, and I'm gonna invest in it. And I'm gonna weather the storm, okay? If you have a good year, I will benefit because every week you get something from the farm, right? If you have a bad year, I'm still there, okay? So it's a commitment uh, to a local farmer, an investment in what he's doing. Um, and the local farmer, of course, is going to do his very best to get you high quality vegetables, produce that you need, eggs, meat, and other things that may be a part of that, um, which is a healthier, better way to get your food. What we've been hearing is that there's so many people wanting CSAs now that farmers are scrambling to grow enough, okay? That's never happened before. Victory gardens is another concept um, that is coming up time and time again. People call it different things, but a lot of times you hear victory gardens because those were the gardens um, that people were encouraged to plant during World War II when they were told, don't rely so much on the overall food system, try because the troops needed it and so on, try to provide for yourself and the government promoted and gave a lot of information about how to uh, grow the Victory Gardens. They also provided um, 
local canning classes and canning sites where people would go and be able to have the equipment necessary to do their own canning and preserving. Are we going to do that? A lot of us don't have time to do that, although we have more time than we used to right now. Um, but it doesn't take that long to grow a garden, and a lot of people now see the sense in being able to supply some of their own food. The idea of the gift economy is becoming more pop popular. There are buy nothing Facebook sites all over the United States, um, and uh, they, the philosophy behind buy nothing is the gift economy. And that is a non-reciprocal type of concept in which people just ask for what they need, and if there's anybody out there who has it, they uh, somebody else provides it. Um, at this point in time, the Buy Nothing groups have stopped um, uh, basically advertising extra stuff that they tap, happen to have, you know, Barbie collections and clothing, and they've really gotten down to brass tacks and said, if you really need something, like to get through your day, then ask. Um, and otherwise, you know, and we, we don't want the other types of offers. So what you're seeing on these uh, sites, and I'm sure there are other modes for gift economy, um, is some serious mutual aid, again. Also, uh, local currencies have been around for a long time in various cities, but I suspect, we I mean, don't have them here, but I suspect that those local currencies are becoming a little bit more important right now for some people. Resilience groups are springing up. That's another term that you may hear, resilience. The idea of being stronger locally, stronger personally, stronger as a family, stronger in your neighborhood, in your local community, in order to weather the storm, to be able to um, survive and bounce back. Um, and finally, one thing that I've noticed is in the midst of all this, people are calling for more transparency in their local governments. Most people don't pay any attention to their local government, but right now, people are because they've realized that what's going on at their local level in their police department, their hospital, you know, their health department, that's critical. And what they've noticed is sometimes local, uh, local city commissions, county commissions are not terribly transparent. Meaning that they may, they, especially now with coronavirus, maybe they're not streaming their meetings. Okay, maybe because they can't, because it's a technical problem. But still, people are demanding that they do so. They're taking an interest in their local government. And that is very good. The more we take back our local governments by paying attention and demanding what we need, the more we will be helping ourselves at the local level. Anyway, so there's some thoughts on the idea of mutual aid. I hope this has helped both philosophically as well as practically. Um, I'm thinking about doing a short series on Edmund Burke and kind of coupling Edmund Burke's philosophy with Edward Bernstein's philosophy. Bernstein wrote Evolutionary Socialism, and of course Edmund Burke is famous for reflections on the revolution in France. They came from different times, but I think in some ways their way of thinking speaks to each other. Um, and I want to ask the question, is there ever a time when a conservative should choose socialism? All right, so I will uh, see you next week. Bye.